Okay, so quick recap, I guess, of some of the slides from last day. The basic idea that we want to talk about is anything that has some sort of restoring force. Um, I think the two best ways of imagining this are either a pendulum or something on a spring. Uh, I don't actually have the pendulum hooked up yet, but you guys can imagine that we're going to use that hook up in the ceiling next week. If I were to take a, a pendulum attached a weight to it and pull it back, right, the restoring force is essentially a force that causes it to move. Right? And the pendulum would start to eventually swing from this side. You know, it would actually swing through the middle to the other side, and then it would get pulled back and get pulled back again. Uh, a very similar concept is going to happen here with a spring. And this one I can visualize a little better because today's lab was supposed to be involving this. Here we go. So today what we'll do is we'll hang a weight on a spring. And you can see that it's going to bounce up and down, right? And what's going to cause it to move back and forth is a restoring force. As I pull this back down here, once I let go of this, right, really just two, two forces in motion are gravity is going to keep trying to pull it back down. And the spring itself has what's called a restoring force, hence the F. S in the little formula that tries to talk about, um, sorry, the S actually, I think it's not the spring actually, but the restoring force basically is what pulls it back up against the flow. Does that make sense? So, um, do you guys get the term equilibrium point? It's kind of like where normal balance would be. So if we had the pendulum and the pendulum comes straight down, that would be equilibrium, and when I pull it out to the side, then it's not at equilibrium anymore. So, um, Basically, there would have been a new formula for you to work on, Fs equals negative Kx. Honestly, it's very simple to work with. If you want to find it, you need to know the spring constant, because every item has a different amount of strength stretchiness to it, if that makes sense. If I had a bow on a bow and arrow, you can imagine that depending on the, the type of material, the how tight you kind of strung the string, it would have a little bit more, a little bit less springiness to it, I guess. Right. So that's one factor. The second factor is how far back you pull it. So I don't remember what I drew in my notes when you guys watched the video, but hopefully you'd agree that like right about there is kind of where normal would be. Right. And based on this, you'd have pulled back this the string, the spring, whatever you want to talk about. You pulled it back a certain amount. That's your x value. Does that work so far? Uh, why the negative sign? Did I cover that well enough in the video last year? Yeah. Yeah, essentially what ends up happening is if you define this to be the positive direction, that the distance you pull is going back, the restoring force is going to go the other way. So the advice I'd give is don't worry about the negative too much. We'll just deal with it as it comes up. One direction actually matters. But there is a negative in the formula because you can see we put these little uh, vector hats on top of things. So since direction does matter, that's why a negative is on there. Um, you guys would have had some basic practice on equations. Any real issues with kind of going over those examples? For the most part, it's just kind of adding a new formula to dynamics. So. We got this far, right? In those notes? Okay. Um, basically, you can then find a period, and this is what we're going to do today in our lab. Uh, the period is how long it takes for the spring basically to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Remember, period is a length of time measured in seconds. So if you want to figure out how long it takes something to go there and back and get back to start, you need to know basically two things. You need to know how heavy it is, and you have to know if that spring constant is. If you know those things, that's pretty straightforward formula. So, um, you guys okay with this example here? Um, and then there's pendulums, and I want to think that pendulums, about halfway through this is where we kind of run out of time in the videos, right? So, um, essentially, pendulums have the same sort of concept. As the pendulum swings back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, there is a restoring force, um, similar to the spring, right? The spring would cause the thing, whether it's horizontal or vertical, to bounce down and then bounce up and then bounce down and then bounce up. Actually, that's not really fair. Uh, gravity pulls it down. The uh, restoring force kind of pulls it back up again. So, um, anyways, it's basically got the same sort of concept. It's really a component of gravity, though, right? Really, what's happening is gravity is pulling you straight down, and based on that, there's like a perpendicular force and there is a uh, restoring force. The idea being that this angle right here should hopefully be that angle right here, because really that's the, the same sort of geometry. So. You know how we used to solve for like mg sine theta, and that was fd? 
Well, not even the exact same, it's the same thing, only rather than calling it a down, downhill force, you can call it a restoring force, or whatever variables you want to use. So, uh, this does fail, though, when the angle gets bigger. Uh, it only works for about the first, I don't know, let's say 20 degrees of angle. So if you have a pendulum and you try to pull it back 45 degrees, the math actually doesn't hold. So we're just going to assume that we always pull this back like, just a reasonable amount. But the further you pull it back, other things kind of come into play. So. Um, picture. Was this the example you guys were finishing off? Or is this one? You got further this one? Okay. Can we even this one? Or is this one here? Okay, why don't we take this one from the top? And uh, do you guys have your assignment number one nearby? If not here, I'll... Uh, Show you a picture of the first question. If you have assignment number one, this is going to be a very, very similar question. So if you don't have assignment one, just read it off the screen with me here. Um, here's the scenario. You've got a wrecking ball being hung from a crane. Uh, it tells you some stuff about the wrecking ball, including the mass. But most importantly here, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of values, including a maximum height, a length on a wire, and how far out you swing it. So I'm kind of going to tell you how like how tall the thing is, how far back it's pulled. Uh, the, the thing that's going to make this more challenging is it's not just going to be physics, but you kind of have to get a good picture because there's a bit of geometry involved in terms of figuring out like your, uh, you know, what, what truly is the distance it, it's going to travel. There's a little bit of like a Pythagoras' theorem involved. So this question here, by the way, this number one, is very similar in our notes to this one. Just so you guys are aware. Uh, let me retake it from the top, regardless of whatever I did two years ago. Uh, let's try drawing a picture here. So I think I was inspired this one here when I was pushing Kinsey out on a swing at one point. So imagine that you've got a uh, swing set. Not the greatest artist. And on the swing set, you have a kid on a swing. So here's Kinsey M. Actually, that's not that okay. Is this is where I kind of started last year. And uh, from there, I almost have to kind of redraw this a little bit. What we've got here is a height above the ground. Because this is the equilibrium point, right? When she's just sitting on the swing naturally. Where this is uh, from here to here is 0 0.35 meters. Um, and then what I did is I told you, well, this is how far back I'm going to pull Kinsey on the swing. I'm going to pull her back to here. And I pulled her back so that this distance right here is uh, 0 0.87 meters. Now, one thing I got to point out, when you pull the swing back, you know how she used to be 0 0.35 meters above the ground? When I pull her back that 0.87 meters, she's no longer 0 0.35 meters above the ground. Can you guys envision how that's going to work? Because right? you pull it back, it actually pulls it a little bit higher. Okay. Uh, the other thing we get to know, though, is how long the swing is. And the swing is 2.87 meters regardless. So that means that either from here to here is 2.67 meters. So that's going to be kind of a mess there. Or probably a little bit better here would be to draw it over like that. So I'm going to redraw a triangle now that looks like this. Um, this distance right here is 2.67 meters. The actual swing itself, if that makes sense, I'll here, let me draw two lines here, and then this is the this is Kinsey sitting on her swing. Does that make sense? Uh, that's 2.67 meters. I've pulled her back a horizontal distance of the 0 0.87 meters. So before I do anything, um, there's actually kind of a triangle hidden in here. You guys kind of see how there's a, there's a triangle kind of snuck into there? Uh, first thing I'd like to do here is let's find the angle from the equilibrium point. I know that's out of order, but we should be able to find this angle right here. How am I going to do that? Inverse of sine cosine or tan? Sine. Sine. Because yeah. if I'm looking for this angle that's been pulled back, right? Like imagine that I've got, imagine I don't have a pendulum set up, right? But imagine that you pull it back. How far angle wise have I pulled it back? 
Well, the swing itself is 267. I've pulled her back 0 0.87. Okay. So we should, for part B, we should sign inverse the opposite over the hypotenuse. And that should get us the angle that she's been pulled back on the swing. Uh, 19 degrees, which is on the borderline for the math still working out properly in terms of this, but 19 degrees is pretty reasonable. You know that one graph I showed you a while back there. So this should still work. So far, so good. Okay. Uh, what I did skip was part A, the actual uh, height above the ground. So let's see that I can illustrate this. I've already talked about this concept. We really want to know how far it is from here to here now. It's not actually 0.35. It's going to be a little bit taller than 0.35. What would really be good to do is try to figure out this y value right here. If we could figure out this y value, that y value would be from here to there. Can you guys kind of picture how from here to here would be how high it is from there to there which it gets pulled up to? If I could find that value, that'd be really useful. So to solve for that, you could either use, I don't know, cosine or something like that, or probably best just to use Pythagoras' theorem. Right, so like y squared plus 0 0.87 squared would be 2.67 squared. And solve for that y value. How much height there happens to be right here. Uh, I got 2.524. Are we good with that so far? Okay, so I know this is going to be a bit of a mess here, but this y value right here, that's 2.524. Well, the actual height above the ground is really made up of two things. There's the 0.35 that was always above the ground. But then there is the sorry, color here. Then there is the extra little bit up that it gets pulled. And we really want to find that extra little bit up that it gets pulled. To find that, remember how the whole length of the swing was uh, 2.67? So if you take 2.67 and you subtract this 2.52, that'll tell you how much extra vertical height it was swung upwards by. From here to here, was 2.67 in purple. Uh, in green, this was 2.54. So if you take 2.67 and subtract 2.524, I got 0.145. That's how much extra height would have been added. Right? Essentially, your y value right here from here to here, this 2.67 would have been 2.67 down to here. This was 2.54. So this bit in between here, which I'm really just scribbling in quite a bit, that says 0 0.1547. We'll add that to the 0.35 meters above the ground. And now your final answer is 0 0.4957 meters above the ground. Is it we'll follow that? Uh, I can probably do it way better with manipulatives than trying to draw it on paper. You getting some answer? Okay. okay, last one. This is probably the more typical question. We've got to find the restoring force. Uh, to find the restoring force, essentially, what's the best diagram to use? Probably this one right here. Um, as the guy's getting pulled back, and we have that angle, that, that angle now is 19 degrees or so. Really what's happening is there is a restoring force that's going to pull him this way, right? But that restoring force is really just a product of gravity. Right? It's a component of gravity, just like your downhill force. 
So once you get the concept of this, to find your restoring force, it's just going to be mass times gravity times the sine of theta. Very similar to the damper force. And you should have all that information. Because the mass is 26, gravity is 981, and it's the sine of that 19 degrees number. Uh, what's this side right here? I'm going to ask you what this side of the triangle would represent. Yeah, it is. Not such normal force. I have a better word for it. Even better than that. That would be the tension in the rope. That makes sense? And that would be how much tension the swing would be able to withstand. You guys are both kind of right in a way. I mean, we've used that in previous examples. Only it's not really probably best to call it a normal force because the normal force is the table pushing back up on the car. We really don't have that scenario here. But it is kind of the same in a way where the kid is getting pulled down this way and then the cable itself is a tethered to like, you know, there's like a truss along the top here, right? There is tension in that rope in that same sort of way. So whatever this component right here has to be, that would be the tension on the on the whole piece there. So just so you guys are aware, if ever ask you to find tension on a pendulum, you're then looking for what used to be the perpendicular slash normal force. Does that help clear things up? Okay. Okay, I didn't get this far in those notes of the day, did I? Okay, so this last one is very straightforward. This is what we're gonna do in our lab on next week, Monday. So you don't have to completely forget it, but it's not really relevant to today's lab. Uh, basically, it's very similar to springs. You can find a period of a pendulum. Uh, all you need to know is two things. One, the length of the pendulum, and two, what gravity is. Um, because we're typically on Earth, you actually only ever need to know one thing. You just need to know how long your pendulum is, because gravity is typically going to be 9.81. So, uh, let's just walk through these last two examples here. Find, uh, tell, tell me how long it's going to take a pendulum to go back and forth in seconds if its length is 16.7 meters. Uh, your new formula, the period of something is uh, 2 pi times by the square root of the length over gravity. Did I get that right? Did I get right? So 2 pi square root of 16.7 over 9.81. It really is a very, very basic formula. Eight point two zero six. This is what we're going to do next week. We're going to take a uh, the little hook I've got on the roof there. We're going to try different masses, and we're going to try different lengths of pendulum, and we're going to basically pull the pendulum back, and we're going to let it swing. And we're going to see how long, time-wise, it takes for it to go back and forth. And then we're going to use this formula and see how long the formula says it should go back and forth. Uh, one thing that we should discover is that if we change the mass, it shouldn't change anything, actually, because this formula doesn't account for mass as any part of it. So if I use a heavier weight, it should still take just as long to go back and forth. Does that make sense? If I use a lighter weight, it should work just the same way. So then we'll, uh, we'll be able to see whether we have the quote-unquote correct answer, because we'll do the math for what it should be. We'll time and see what it should be, and hopefully it ends up being the same. Uh, it is possible for you to calculate the acceleration due to gravity, then, in other locations on Earth. Normally, we calculate acceleration due to gravity by, um, you know, let's say, dropping an object and finding a distance, a time, a velocity initial. But um, it's actually easier now to calculate gravity based on a pendulum. If you bring a pendulum with you to the moon, which I know sounds kind of ridiculous, but that would be the best way to calculate a, uh, um, a gravitational field strength. Because that formula we just showed you, the period equals 2 pi 
times L over G. If you want to know what the gravitational field strength is on the planet you have, all you need to do is bring a pendulum, know the length of the pendulum, and know how long, and visually, visually watch and see how long it takes the pendulum to go back and forth. Right. So that's actually an easier way to find gravity. So here's where it comes back. It's 333 goes here, 275 goes here, and you're solving for gravity. Your biggest issue is really just not screwing up the algebra. So let's walk through what you need to do stepwise to get this by itself, because that is a bit more challenging. Uh, first bit, you should get rid of the 2 pi. And if I can give some advice, put 2 pi in brackets, because your calculator will interpret, if you just write it as 2 pi, not in brackets, it'll think you want to divide by 2, but actually times by pi rather than divide. To get rid of the square root sign, you should square both sides. Um, now you have g on the bottom of the fraction. We don't want g on the bottom, we want g on the top. So you can approach this a few different ways. But my favorite would just be to take all of this stuff and like cross multiply it in a way. So I'm going to bring g up to the top of this side over here. I don't want this 2 pi on the bottom here though. So I'm going to bring this 2 pi from the bottom and bring it up top over there. Um, but I should point out though that it's now 2 pi squared. Because when you square both sides, you have to square both the top and the bottom. So g is now up here. 2 pi is now up over here. That 3.33, which is kind of hidden behind a mess of stuff, is really next to g right here. I'll divide by 3.33. But again, it also needs to be squared. Honestly, I don't really care how this works out algebraically for you, just as long as you can get the right answer. Apparently, the gravity in this location on Earth is a little lower than normal, probably because you're on top of a mountain. Right? And the higher up in altitude you go, the less gravity there is. But rather than calculating the acceleration due to gravity using kinematics, which would be finding the distance something falls, the time it takes to fall, knowing your velocity initial is zero and solving for acceleration, the faster way of doing that is just bring a pendulum with you. Does that make sense? Um, I'm going to get any questions from the last uh, that section there. Sorry, it's all broken into pieces between Thursday and today. Reasonable? Cool. Okay, let's try our lab. The lab's not intended to take overly long. It's another simulation. So. Um, okay, here's the simulator. So, uh, one of the reasons why I want to use a simulator for this one rather than doing it in real life is uh, I want to ignore friction. Uh, currently, if I were to take a mass and I were to let it go up and down, just like in real life, we do have a bit of an issue. Slowly over time, what's going to happen? Friction will slow this thing down, right? And, and that's going to screw things up for us because I, I don't want to have to account for that. So what I can do, though, is I can, in a frictionless environment, turn it down to none. There, now there is no friction anymore. Now, if I do this, that should happen for ever. Which is kind of nice because if I need to then calculate how much, uh, how how long it takes time-wise, I can throw on the stopwatch here. By the way, I'll do that in a second here. And then when I stop, we can then count how many times it goes up and down. And I don't have to worry about it stopping. Whereas if I do have friction on, it won't work. So uh, help me out here. What was the first thing I said to do on the instructions? So I don't have it in front of me. Okay, so I put friction on high just to make sure it stopped there. Uh, first thing I want to do is find the new equilibrium position. So why don't we say that the new equilibrium position is right there? Hey guys. Good morning. Anybody want breakfast?
Okay, thank you. Okay, so this line right here now represents where the new equilibrium happens to be. Okay, what's next? Okay, so it really doesn't matter now what we do for how far we pull this. I'm just going to now set the spring and let it go, basically. And it should now go continuously. So while it does that, let's talk about what we're going to do. What's the whole goal of our lab? What's our purpose? Yeah, I think it was to find the spring constant, which we represent with k. So uh, there's a couple ways we could do this. Uh, one is to treat it from a dynamics point of view. A free body diagram of this thing would be that gravity is pulling it down and the restoring force is pulling it up. We could do something along those lines if we wanted. Uh, but I'm going to use the other formula that we've learned over the last little while, which is that the period of a spring was uh, 2 pi times the square root of, and I believe this was either m over k or k over m. Do you guys happen to have a formula sheet nearby? It's been a while since I've done this. I haven't gotten memorized very well yet. I don't want the, the pendulum one. The pendulum one was L over gravity. There's the one right next to it, though. M over K? Okay. You guys good so far? That's the formula we're going to use. If I wanted to arrange for K, isn't this almost the exact same thing we just did on the gravity example to get K by itself? So maybe as a way of demonstrating it, what you could do is you could divide by 2 pi. You could then square both sides. And then to get k by itself, essentially you have to cross multiply. So k comes up, mass goes next to 4 and pi, and period goes on the bottom. And this would be, I mean I did this fairly quickly. But essentially, this would be how you'd algebra if we solve for k. It was 2 pi, but you squared it. I kind of skipped a step here. You see how when I squared to get rid of the side right here? I squared the t to get t squared. But I have to square both of these guys. So when you square 2, then it's 4. When you square pi, it's 5. Okay. Um, we're going to solve this graphically again. Um, yay. So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to plot on one axis of a graph, we're going to plot 4 times the mass times pi squared, and that will be our rise. And then our run will be the period squared. And what we're going to do is we're going to change the mass. And as the mass changes, so should the period. And hopefully what we'll do is we'll get a couple of points. Those points will then be linear. Well, this won't be nearly as bad as your last lab, by the way, because we're not going to do like 10 trials and two different graphs. We're just going to do it a few times. But you should hopefully be able to get yourself a nice triangle where when you find the rise, the rise value here is the top of your value there. Your run value here for your triangle should give you that one there. And when you find that slope, your slope should be your k value. It will follow that. So essentially all we need out of our results then is to plot two things. Uh, we're going to test the mass, and as we change the mass, we're going to change and see how that affects the period. And then we'll just plot them against each other. So we just want to have a few points. Um, help me out. Read through the rest of the instructions. What did I say was next then? So this guy's still oscillating. What's the next instruction? Okay, so I guess we haven't quite finished yet. We need to um, do some of these different masses. So I think what we have here is a mass of 250. I got one of 100. I got one of 50. We have some unknown masses as well. I wonder if I can hang two of them on there at once. Let me pick. Let me just stop. Lots of pictures. To it. It's okay, I guess we might only do this three times. Obviously, the unknown masses are not all that useful to us because if I don't know how heavy this mass is, we can't use it. Right. Um, I could have swore you 
put one under the set one. Okay. Okay, so anyways, what we're going to do here is um, I'm going to set it in motion. What we're going to do, I think the best way of counting this, is we're going to count how long it takes to go up and down 10 times. I'll start the stopwatch, and once it's hit the 10th time, then I'll press pause. And then our period will be divided by 10. Does that make sense? Because I might go too fast to count it just once. So if I count it 10 times and then press pause, that might be the best way of doing it as accurately as possible. So I'll do one just as a, as a, um, just as a test. So um, basically I'm going to pull this down. It doesn't really matter how far I pull it down. It should work the same either way. Better turn friction back off, though. Okay, and then once I think I got the hang of it, I'll press start and we'll count 10 together. Does that make sense? One. Actually, I started on zero, didn't I? Go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Make sense? Okay. So we'll go with uh, the 100 gram mass as requiring 6.26 seconds for 10 oscillations, though, right? So make sure you write that down. The 100 gram mass required 6.26 seconds for 10 oscillations. This is a really easy calculation, though. To find the period, then, what's the period going to be? 0 0.626 seconds, right? You just have to divide by 10. Ten oscillations took 6.26 seconds. I'll do it one more time just to make sure that it's in the same ballpark. Go. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Make sense? That's pretty close. 6.23 seconds. So, ten oscillations. Each oscillation is about 0.62 of a second. Okay, so now we want to repeat this, but now we want to do it with a different mass. So we'll take off the 100 gram mass and we'll put on, say, the 50 gram mass. Uh, one of the things you'll notice here, and we're not really doing the lab to try to measure just how much it gets dragged downwards, but obviously you can see that the restoring force is less, right? right? Because the spring doesn't actually need to pull back up quite as much because the mass isn't quite as heavy. Right, so I'll we'll just move that to there. But we'll do sort of the exact same thing. We'll try this different mass, and we'll see how the mass affects the period this time. You guys ready? From the bottom. Go. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So hopefully I did that properly. We'll try it one more time just to make sure that I'm in the ballpark there. But it looks like I got ten oscillations in four point four four seconds. Try to catch this from the bottom here. Actually, you know what? It'd be smarter here. Why don't I turn this down to one quarter time? There's actually a nice little toggle right here. This might actually make it easier to see here. See how I can make it slow down here? Okay. So I'll try 10 from here. Go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, and ten. What did I have lost? Four forty-four. Four forty-six is pretty reasonable margin of error there. Sound good? And uh, let's do it one more time now for the heaviest mass. Oh. oh, 
I guess I should turn Perch back on. Okay, let's put it back on real time to start. Oh, I can do this on real time. Okay. And we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Nine ninety four. Give it a tick. Which means your period then is a tenth of that point nine nine four. Let me just try that one more time. Nine ninety four. Here we go. And go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I mean, margin of error here is, what was that, by point zero five? I mean, five milliseconds. And keep in mind, that was also, we now are doing it over ten trials. So really, I'm off by 0.5 over 10 trials. That's that's really not all that much. So. Okay, so that'll have to do. Unless I can try one more time. I swear there's a way to link these guys. Apparently not. Um, okay. Let me actually find that lab myself so I can talk to it. Thanks a lot. Okay. So we attached the mass to the third spring, we set the new equilibrium point, we set the friction to high, we oscillated it, we figured out the period of a mass. Okay. Uh, we've done that for different masses. I said four trials, but apparently we're only doing three, because I mean, in lieu of not knowing what that mass happens to be, we don't really have an option, right? So, Okay, so that's it. Our lab is done. <laughs> okay. So what I need from you guys then, as we go forward, is your results are only two marks. Okay. So. I mean, really, the only results you should have then are the mass. Uh, by the way, please don't call it a weight. Um, I was docking some marks in the last lab. If you called it a weight, uh, weight is mass times gravity. The mass of, you know, how it's uh, like 250 grams, that's not weight, that's technically mass. So make sure you use the terms properly. So you should have your mass, and uh, you should have how long it took. That's literally all there is to that. So, um, on this lab here, I won't really expect any qualitative observations because really there's nothing else to observe. Because using the simulator, we were able to do this in a frictionless environment to try to avoid any sort of loss of energy. So that page is done. So now for your analysis, I've got five marks here. You do have to make a nice table of values, although rather than last time having like ten points to kind of convert, you really only have to do this a few times. But you have to do some calculations because on one axis, you need to plot 4m times pi squared. And on the other axis, you have to plot period squared. Does that make sense? So find me a table of values. And then once you've found those values on your graph here, the next part here is graph them. Only unlike last time where you had to plot 10 points, you got to plot Four would have been better. The three, right? So plot your three points wherever they happen to be. You should hopefully get a straight line. I can't draw a line using this tool, but hopefully you get the concept. Draw a straight line. Calculate the slope of that line. That slope is your k value for the um, for the spring. That's it. That's our that's our lab. Easy. Okay. Uh, let's talk to the post-lab questions real quick here. Control manipulating responding variables. What did we control? Yeah, we used the same spring every time, right? I just randomly said pick spring 3, but we didn't all of a sudden change to spring 2 or spring 1. Uh, we also did one other thing. We controlled the amount of, yeah, which was none. It made it easiest to work with. If we did this in real life, we would have needed to account for the fact that there is going to be a certain amount of friction that's going to slow this thing down and won't oscillate for forever. So, so we controlled that. I uh, manipulated the mass. Don't say weight. Please say mass. And uh, responding. 
be more specific though, the time that it took to oscillate is known as the period. Like time, time is good, but let's call it a period. That's its official name. Um, I'm not really going to add much number two. You guys should be able to talk about period and frequency by now. Um, the negative sign in the formula fs equals negative kx. I talked about earlier today. Um, here I've got a thing where you're, you're going to need to find a textbook. If you don't have a textbook, I will lend you mine somehow. Um, do you guys actually have textbooks? I really don't use them, so I understand why you don't. Let's see, see if you can get a hold of one. If not, I'll find you a copy. Um, basically, there's a page in your textbook here where it talks about where the velocity of the spring will be zero and where it'll be at its highest. Let's um, let's go back to the simulator here, and we'll put it in slow motion. Okay. As I put it in slow motion, where is the velocity zero? There's two locations. And there. Right there. And there. That's where its velocity is zero, right? Because essentially, as the pendulum or spring is at its peak, uh, that's where it's got either the highest or lowest velocity, or no, no velocities. If you've seen one of these graphs before, essentially when it's at this point or at this point right here, it's highest or it's lowest, there is no velocity at that point, right? Because that's where it's about to turn around. Uh, where would its velocity be the highest? Say a Yeah, I mean, I didn't actually set up this line properly, right? But wherever the line would be, wouldn't its velocity be the highest, like kind of in the middle, right? Where here it's going slow, faster, slowing down, getting faster, slowing down, getting faster, slowing down, right? At a certain point right in the middle, that equilibrium point is where it's going fastest. So um, find that page in the textbook, just use as a reference and illustrate that. That's kind of what I'm going for. Uh, the rest are really just some questions. So you've got a question where you've got to find some spring constants based on a kid on a trampoline. And uh, another one here on a toy gun spring. So you guys can work on those ones when you get to there. And then the, the last one here, uh, there are many objects that would have a restoring force um, where objects are deformed in some sort of way. Let me give you some examples of things that have elasticity. And I'll give you one for free. A basketball or a volleyball deforms. Right? Because that's how it actually bounces. Right? Essentially what happens is as you bounce the basketball into the ground, it squishes the basketball just a little bit, and then it springs back up again. Does that make sense? Right. So, have you ever seen like a slow motion video of, uh, like say, a hockey player shooting a hockey puck? His stick will bend. Right? It's kind of a similar concept there. So think of some other examples where you have a, a deformation of the object. And as the object then springs back to its normal shape, it causes a bounce of some kind. Then the very last one is the conclusion. And kind of like last time here, uh, I can't really get you to do a percent or anything along those lines because we don't have a right answer to compare to. And we use the simulator anyways. So can you guys basically describe to me if we had this apparatus in my lab, what would it, what would it have looked like? So for example, step one might have been to find a spring and a mass and hang it from the ceiling, right? And then you'd have to, you know, take the mass, find out where the equilibrium point is, pull the mass down, let it oscillate for a little while. Can you describe to me what we would have done in a hands-on environment? So honestly, it would look almost the exact same as a simulator. It's just, you know, re-describe to me what it would have looked like in a in our lab. That's it. This is one of the easier lectures you guys probably do. Any questions? Okay, uh, you have half an hour. I don't mean to put pressure on you that you should get it done by the end of the class, but I bet you guys are finishing your chunk for today. So. Uh, last thought, um, don't fall behind on your assignment. If I can give some advice, try a question every day. Um, you should be able to do the first question on that um, wrecking ball going back and forth when you get a moment. And uh, just so you guys know what the plan is, for the rest of this week here, we basically have a whole bunch of lessons. So we're doing a lesson tomorrow, lesson Wednesday, lesson Thursday, workday Friday. Then next week, Monday, we're going to do another lab. And then I believe after that lab, it's workday, workday quiz. And then we have a long weekend. So lab today, lesson, 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 the rest of this week. Day off Friday. Another lab Monday, workday, workday, 
and then a quiz next week Thursday, and then you guys have next week Friday off. All right, sound good? All right, uh, get to it, I guess. I'll keep you from it. Thank you.